thanks very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, great to see uh, all of you here this morning um, to talk about, uh, as Declan said, I think a very uh, complex and difficult topic, but a very, very important one uh, in all of our societies today. Uh, as Dorothy mentioned, um, I'm Scott Griffin. I'm representing the International Press Institute, which is a global media freedom organization uh, based in Vienna. And it's uh, actually an association, it's the members of membership association of uh, editors, publishers, and journalists uh, from around the world. It was founded in 1950, actually, by a group of editors who believed that uh, media freedom could be a tool to promote peace. Uh, and in its history, it's had uh, sort of the main mandate of protecting um, journalistic freedom, uh, but sort of a complementary mandate of uh, promoting good journalism, good independent journalism, and obviously a part of that is uh, practicing ethical, uh, ethical reporting and avoiding uh, things like hate speech. Um, but again, this is a really uh, complicated issue, in particular for, for freedom of expression defenders, uh, because certainly you know, laws against hate speech are a way of restricting speech in a way that we do agree with, of course. Um, but, you know, in our view, it's really important to try to find the right balance um, between freedom of expression on the one hand and um, a set of rights on the other that, that are threatened by hate speech. And, and that's sort of what I wanted to just discuss in these 20 minutes this morning is sort of hate speech in the context of, of freedom of expression. Uh, and as, as I've already mentioned, um, we sort of look here at at, at a balance between two rights or sets of rights. On the one hand, you have free expression, which includes the right to uh, transmit and receive information, um, you know, including information that may shock, offend, or disturb us, um, both because there's this public aspect of free expression that's, you know, in terms of the media's role um, in democratic society, and there's also a private aspect in terms of the role that free expression plays in you know, our own uh, self-development and self-determination. So this is on the one side. On the other side, you have um, a, s a number of rights that can be threatened by hate speech. If you think about the speech itself, the act, of the act itself, you have something like a right to dignity, you know, which can be, uh, so the way that one feels uh, when one is confronted with hateful remarks. Uh, but then you have the rights that are affected by the consequences of hate speech, um, the right to non-discrimination, right to bodily integrity or even the right to life if we're talking about you know, um, speech that really incites uh, serious forms of violence. Um, I don't know if this sounds easy, in, easy uh, but, but certainly it's not easy in practice uh, to, find where this, to find where this balance lies. And there are a number of reasons for that. And one is uh, certainly the, the, that there is a problem in defining what hate speech actually is. Um, and I'm sure if I asked everyone in this room to define hate speech, I would probably get you know, uh, a different answer from each person. Uh, and that's because in many ways it's, it, it can be quite a subjective uh, concept and you know, might reflect the way sort of you know, our own personal backgrounds, our own personal beliefs. Um, but in a general level, we can, we can say that there, are, there is a legal definition of hate speech um, if you look at international law, which I'm not, I'm not going to go into this morning, but generally hate speech in the law is, is speech that incites, or that, that can incite um, hatred, discrimination, or violence. Um, but, be, but in addition to this legal definition, obviously we have other kinds of definitions, you know, moral and ethical definitions, sort of that's the kind of speech that, that we see or that we perceive as being hateful. Uh, or as being sort of driven by intolerance of others. And this kind of speech, uh, which you know, I think is, is certainly part of what this project is, is trying to address, may or may not rise to the level of uh, illegal hate <coughs> speech. And that's sort of an important distinction to understand, that not everything that we perceive as being hateful is actually something that could be, for that could, for example, lead to a criminal conviction or something like this. We also have um, a problem in terms of uh, whom hate speech laws are intended to protect. Um, if you look at, you know, in, in terms of international law, the original, um, original, the first documents talked about sort of this very classical um, 
uh, types of group identity like race and ethnicity and national origin. And this is a list that has really expanded over time. So now we have, uh, you know, we also include things like uh, disability or gender, sexual orientation, um, veteran status, and uh, you know, in some countries this list gets quite long. So we also see things like, um, you know, political ideology or political party affiliation or even you know trade union affiliation. So it can get quite long, and it's not always clear um, uh, where this list should stop and what should the um, sort of baseline be? How do we determine which groups uh, of people uh, should be protected under hate speech law? So this is something that's still very much debated today. Um, and this leads to a separate distinction that, that we have to make between uh, protecting people versus protecting ideas. And this is something that's, um, that I would say is, is becoming more and more of an issue when we look at, in particular, religion um, these hate speech laws ought to, at least from, from our perspective, they ought to protect people. Um, so, for example, they ought to protect um, people from being attacked based on the religion that they belong to, uh, but they shouldn't protect, uh, for example, um, the ideas or, or belief systems behind a religion, because these sorts of things uh, we think need to be they need to be able to be debated uh, in a society, and at least because religion still has you know, a profound effect on, on, on states and the policies that states set. So this is a distinction that can be difficult to make because certainly you know, many, many attacks on religious belief systems may be driven by, by hate and intolerance, um, so, but we still have to be very careful. And that's why, for example, my, my organization, we oppose blasphemy laws, uh, which still exist in Ireland, for example, but we sort of feel that these laws protect not the people, but, but the belief systems um, behind certain religions. And I think I should mention too that um, you know, hate speech, sort of, this is sort of a theme of the first half of my remarks, it's, there's, no, there's not necessarily a clear definition when we look uh, internationally. And so perhaps many of you know, for example, in the United States, um, the bar for hate speech is much, much higher. That is to say that the, the sphere, the, 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 the the potential for making hateful comments is much greater. Um, you know, the, the famous example is, is from a Supreme Court case in the 1960s when the Ku Klux Klan uh, marched through a town burning crosses and shouting all sorts of uh, racist and, and, uh, and, and bigoted remarks. And eventually the Supreme Court said that uh, their speech was actually protected uh, because it didn't constitute what's called imminent, um, potential for imminent lawless violence, and that standard is very different from what we have in Europe. Uh, the standard doesn't include this, this need to be imminent, so uh, under European law, um, you know, speech that simply incites violence, for example, can be considered hate speech, but that's not the case in the United States, for example. And we also have different standards if you look more to the Islamic world, uh, where uh, things like blasphemy tend to be seen as hate speech, whereas in Europe, uh, we, don't, we, we try to make that distinction. And um, with all this in mind, with keeping in mind the difficulty of defining hate speech, certainly there is also a potential for the concept of hate speech to be, to be overused or to be misused uh, in society. For example, we're all talking a lot about right now about the, the fake news debate and the way that we see it's, you know, there's a lot of well-meaning um, initiatives by governments to, to counter fake news. But we also see on the other side that uh, many of these governments, for example, now s turn to the term fake news when they want to respond to, or the, when they want to discredit um, content that they don't like. And, and to a certain extent, there's this, also this danger with, with hate speech uh, because it's so difficult to define. And, um, you know, for example, we had a case, uh, my organization IPI is very much involved in Turkey, where there's really a terrible, terrible situation um, regarding press freedom. Uh, which, by the way, sh you should support any campaigns uh, supporting press freedom in Turkey because it's a really awful situation. But, uh, for example, last year, two journalists um, from a secular newspaper called Cumhuriyet uh, reprinted um, images from the first uh, uh, from the first uh, issue of Charlie Hebdo that came out after the attacks there, and they wanted to show solidarity with with Charlie Hebdo, uh, and eventually they were convicted uh, and sentenced to prison. Uh, for promoting hate, hate against uh, religious groups, the media. So this is an example that shows 
um, that we do have to be careful in the way that we that we define hate speech and that courts need to be careful in the way that they interpret these concepts because uh, in places where, where freedom of expression is not as well protected, um, there can be serious consequences. Um, as I said, I'm not going to go into the, the legal aspects of hate speech, but I want to turn now just briefly for the rest of the time um, into uh, the challenges that come with hate speech <coughs> online. And it is certainly true that hate speech online um, brings with it an entirely new set of challenges. Um, so beyond all the ones that I've mentioned already, we have um, you know, just obviously probably a much greater amount of hate, as I'm sure we all recognize and we have to deal with in our work. Um, but I would say that one of the biggest problems, one of the central problems of hate speech online is the problems that authorities have uh, in terms of holding people accountable. And uh, one of the messages that I would like to sort of deliver is that we already have hate speech, we already have laws against hate speech, um, so we don't need new laws, but we do need the authorities to actually ensure that these laws are properly carried out. Um, and this is, uh, this is a significant, significant issue, and what we see is that these laws are not being carried out. So we, we know this. This is obvious. You go online to social media, you see that there's a, a ton of uh, hateful remarks out there that do rise to this level of illegal hate speech and that nothing is being done about them. So, so we do see that. And there are a number of reasons, uh, reasons, I don't know if I would call them reasons because we, in fact state authorities uh, should be, uh, should be uh, upholding these laws, but there are a number of reasons that, uh, that, this, that this becomes more difficult. Um, some of these are quite obvious. Think, for example, the principle of, of what's called territoriality. So normally a state's, a state's laws apply to, to that state, but when we talk about hate speech online, we're talking about content that travels very easily across borders. Um, you know, if we, anything that, that's said online here in Ireland um, can easily be read or seen in other parts of the world, and it can be very difficult for, for police uh, to find out who is behind those comments and to hold uh, those people accountable. And uh, we have a very similar problem when it comes to anonymity. Uh, again, uh, the online space uh, is full of or it's full of people who are using who are who are online anonymously, and this creates a certain tension, I must say, um, for freedom of expression because uh, anonymity is is something that we view as free expression offenders as a very important tool for people to be able to express themselves online, in many places in particular where, you know, individuals could face consequences for, um, for for disseminating certain opinions. And it's very important to have that anonymity, but at the same time, this anonymity is precisely uh, one, of the, one of the elements that is making it very difficult for people who do commit hate speech uh, online to be held accountable. And uh, we do know that, for example, social networks are not always uh, forthcoming uh, with the authorities in terms of you know, finding out who is, behind anonymous who is behind anonymous accounts. And then uh, I would mention also that there is a big debate about who actually is responsible for hate speech online. Uh, that is to say, for example, you know, is it internet service providers? So if you use a particular internet service or if you use a particular social media service, um, there are some who would argue that those service providers uh, ought to be held liable, both criminally and civilly, uh, for the comments that users post. Um, and uh, that is a question that again creates a certain tension for freedom of expression because these uh, these service providers and social media networks um, have a very important role to play everywhere really in giving people a chance to express themselves and debate topics and and disseminate opinions and if we start holding them if we start holding them liable uh, this can um, create a certain censoring effect which I'll mention uh, in just a minute and but this is also something that's very much debated. You know, who is who is actually responsible? Is it is it individuals who commit hate speech, or is it the platforms that they use? Uh, and it's something that hasn't been solved yet. So, I, I would say that there's there's this there's a big problem in terms of enforcing the law, and we don't know against whom it should be enforced. Uh, and then uh, I really want to focus just in the last few minutes on on something that is coming up, and this is related to what I was just mentioning, but it's the role of private corporations. Uh, uh, such as you know Facebook and Twitter, 
um, when it comes to, to policing hate speech. Uh, and you probably know that you know, these companies are coming under a great deal of pressure from governments uh, to do something about hate speech. You know, uh, we see it every day and it can be very frustrating uh, when these companies don't remove content that is so obviously uh, in breach of, of hate speech laws. Um, and actually just last week, uh, the German government approved um, a very interesting uh, proposal that will, that will fine uh, Facebook, Twitter and other social media companies up to 50 million euros uh, when they do not remove content that is uh, obviously illegal and has been reported to them uh, from their users. Um, and at first glance, this seems to be, I just want to say a few things about this because this is an issue that's going to be coming up more and more uh, in Europe. And just a few comments about this. Um, it raises a number of, of questions, uh, one of which is uh, how comfortable we are in turning over um, the role of deciding what is and what is not hate speech, what is and what is not allowable content to private corporations. Um, essentially, in this case, you know, instead of a court deciding whether or not you've committed a crime, um, you know, these companies would be deciding whether or not to erase this content based on their understanding of what the law is. Um, and this is sort of a departure if we think about you know, the, the, the principle, the rule of law, um, and many persons, many, many groups that defend free expression have really come out against this proposal um, because they're concerned that these companies will over-censor, uh, will start to over-regulate. I don't know if any of you saw, for example, there was a couple months ago there was a big uh, controversy after Facebook deleted uh, a very famous photo from the Vietnam War that had been posted by, the, by a Norwegian newspaper. And this photo, they said, was child pornography, even though um, this was one of the most famous images uh, from the war and obviously played a key role in terms of building public opinion about the war. So this shows that these kind of companies don't always know, actually, uh, what is what is best when it comes to free expression. So there's this problem of, of, of potentially uh, censorship uh, on social media companies. And there's also the question, I would say, uh, again, coming back to, to the need for, for police and state authorities to hold people who commit hate speech accountable. Um, in this case, social media companies would simply be deleting content. But it's not clear that people, actually, who commit, who, who write sort of these, these hateful expressions would actually be held accountable. And in my view, what we really need uh, is for laws to be enforced. So if people, people need to understand that you know, committing hate speech online is the same thing as committing hate speech out on the street. Uh, and if it's just a question of Facebook and Twitter deleting comments, I'm not sure that people will actually understand that um, when they make certain kinds of remarks, they in fact are, are committing a crime. So. Um, so some voices have come out and said, you know, the emphasis should not be on outsourcing this activity to social media companies, but actually uh, it's up to law enforcement authorities to, to find out who wrote these comments um, and hold them accountable, ultimately. Um, and perhaps also uh, one might want to consider the economic interests that internet service providers um, and, and social media companies like Facebook and Twitter have. Um, if you look at, you know, if you look at, we can look at a number of countries. For example, if you look at Austria, where IPI is based, if you take a look at Facebook and you see um, who are the most popular uh, Facebook users, well, in fact, if you look at the uh, look at politicians, most of the most popular politicians are extreme right-wing politicians who have hundreds of thousands of followers on Facebook, and they do a very good job of uh, provoking hate speech uh, in terms of, you know, they, they know which kind of posts uh, will provoke a flood of commentary under on Facebook. They attack journalists. Um, they attack the right journalists, let's say. They know what their users want. Um, and of course, uh, it would be very difficult, I think, for, for these kind of companies to, to suddenly take a very hard line because, of, because their platforms are very popular with a certain segment uh, of the public. And the same thing in Twitter. We had... Um, We've had a very big uh, problem in Turkey, for example. Uh, Twitter there is the main platform for, for political debate. And we have, uh, IPI has been uh, working to combat online attacks against journalists, 
which isn't the same thing as hate speech, but there are many parallels in terms of the way journalists there are um, you know, threatened with death uh, and uh, maligned based on not only, not only that they are journalists, but that they belong to certain groups, minority groups, or, or because of their gender. And we see that Twitter has done really a terrible job of, of ensuring that these comments um, are deleted and followed up on. Uh, and you know, a cynic might say, well, you know, Twitter, ha Twitter has so many users in Turkey and so many people are engaged in this kind of speech. Um, certainly they are going to be, they're going to want to be careful in terms of the way they react. So there are many things to consider there. And finally, and with this I'll close, um, another thing that, you know, another element of the hate speech debate that is, that is critical is, uh, is media coverage of hate speech. Um, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, I read often, you know, articles saying, uh, you know, there's this one crazy um, politician who said uh, this sort of incredible thing about minorities, uh, some hateful comment, and it becomes, you know, this uh, front page news story. And uh, we really have to think, uh, as media practitioners, how much attention we give to uh, people who are engaging in hate speech. Uh, because in the end, although it is certainly is important to know uh, what our elected officials are saying, we don't need to know what every single one of them is saying all the time, in, particularly, in particular if they have a very limited impact. Um, and so uh, I think that we have to be, be very careful about giving a platform through the media to uh, people who are engaging in hate speech, uh, because in, this, in the end this may help to uh, give legitimacy to particular political actors who may have always been there, they're always fringe, uh, they're always going to be fringe uh, persons in politics, um, but sort of this media attention of, of sort of making a spectacle out of every single hateful comment that is made, uh, again, perhaps uh, gives legitimacy to, to persons who don't actually, who deserve it or, or who otherwise um, would not have it. So I think I've used up my, my 20 minutes. Um, but I hope that I've uh, just touched on you know, a number of different issues that are important to keep in mind when talking about hate speech, which again I say is, it's a really complicated issue, but it's one of the most important uh, issues that we, are, that we are facing now. So thank you very much, and I'm looking forward uh, to the discussion.